And then asking the right questions. I mean, that I work with producers, of course, to prepare questions. But even there, it took a while to figure out how to ask the questions. And I still ask questions that are sometimes criticized as top heavy which means you sort of lay down a whole lot of ground. And it's sometimes necessary because the, audit, the listener doesn't necessarily know that much about the, the person. And I have to sort of at least say, you know, they, you did this and that and that, and, or you wrote this and that and that, and then get my question on, on top of it. Ideally, the questions should be shorter. And then I learned this other rule of questions, which I noticed I violated when we played the clips, when I said, so you, uh, uh, so reading was a trans, was reason, reading a transformative experience for you? And you said no. <laughs> There's, you know, rule 101 in, in interviewing is don't ask a question that can be answered with yes or no. <laughs> and so that's why you'll hear a lot of my questions do have things like, you know, why and how and rather than. Yeah, well, there's, there's some foreign countries where you want to find out what time the train leaves. You don't say, is there a three o'clock train? Because to be polite, they will say yes. You, know? <laughs> you have to say, what time is the train to so and so? So yeah, my, I, I think as, you know what the, what those wrong questions are. They all, what they are they are as you say top heavy and they kind of say too much sometimes. And some I'm not saying that you do this, but I know when I've tried to do this sometimes, there's you know not much space left for the person to answer. Anyway, um, <laughs> so you, you mean you mean like this? <laughs> no. I, I didn't want an answer there. I realized there was no point. Um, so you've interviewed hundreds of writers. Um, I want you ask, want to ask you to choose favorites, but what are some of the conversations that you that have stood out for you? Is there any one person or one or two writers? There are. I wonder, I wonder if I could back up for a yep. second. When you asked, when I was a kid, did I run around interviewing people? Uh, I, I didn't. But. It's probably worth mentioning that the first interview I ever did was while I was at university, and it was with Margaret Atwood. <laughs> I don't think we can go much further with that. <laughs> well, no, I, I, uh, it was because I wasn't, I, I, well, in a sense, my life, my life has more coherence uh, looking back than it mm -hmm. felt like to live forward. So if you look back and you say, oh, you took honors English at McGill and you were, uh, wrote for the McGill Daily and you're the, the literary editor of the McGill Daily and it was during that time that uh, The Circle Game came in by Margaret Atwood and it was, you hadn't really, I'll switch to you to me. I hadn't had much experience uh, even with Canadian literature at that point, but I really liked that book and uh, she was teaching at Sir George Williams, which was now Concordia. And I called her up and we met for tea at a Greek cafe on Park Avenue. And um, in fact, speaking of making mistakes, uh, that's when I, okay, I, I made the mistake of in, 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 in one of the poems, um, I, just, I think it's called, This Is Not a Poem of Me. This is not a photograph of me. Uh, sorry, in one of the poems, This Is Not a Photograph of Me. And it says something, if you look very carefully, you will see me like, you know, waving, not drowning, or drowning, not waving, or some, something like that. There's some ambiguity there. And I made the mistake of saying something like you, conflating the person in the poet, the person in the poem with the woman sitting across from me. And she said, you know, a writer is not a tube of toothpaste. <laughs> you don't just squeeze it and out comes the poem. So I learned not to ask mm -hmm. that kind of question. <laughs> <laughs> and then she got even more famous. <laughs> so tell us about another writer that uh, was important for you. Well. One of the writers, I, I mean, I do have, uh, it's very hard to say they're, they're, they're favorites, but one of the writers that I really wanted to interview and then most enjoyed interviewing for, for the longest time, I, it took a while to get because I had to, he didn't have a book out and I was trying to get a, an interview with him, and that's Oliver Sacks. And uh, the, the humanist neurologist, uh, he's probably most famous for the man who mistook his wife for a hat. Right. In fact, I remember when that book came out, there was a New Yorker cartoon, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Dishwasher. <laughs> I, th I, think, I think we have a clip. Is that right, Mary? Oh, but I, I want to oh, set, set that up. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Okay. <laughs> you're trying to, scare, you're going to try to stop me from my <laughs> no, no, bad I, jokes. No, no, I'm sorry. I'm not used to this role. <laughs> 
so I w it was very hard to get him, and this was back in 1994, and he happened to be coming to Toronto to, to speak um, at the Clark Institute, so I was able to get a, a contact. And um, at that time, it, he was just putting together the pieces that became part of an anthropologist on Mars, and they were the wonderful combination of uh, biography and biology, and there were these long profiles that had been in the New Yorker. And I, I, I just, uh, he, he He's, I just find him one of the most um, uh, lovable, uh, huggable uh, writers and people. And so I interviewed him then, and then again when his, uh, he came out with a book called The Island of the Colorblind, and, and then again with uh, a memoir called Uncle Tungsten. Because in the earlier interviews, we didn't, even surprisingly for me, didn't talk that much about his personal life, but in Uncle Tungsten, memoirs of a chemical boyhood. He talked a lot about himself and his background and his own life. And um, it was quite revealing. And we have a, a, a clip from Oliver Sacks. My mother was, uh, was extremely shy and uh, I think probably a little, a little withdrawn socially, or, although very much at ease with, with, with her patients and her students, when in fact I think she became a sort of, a sort of performer sometimes there were later I heard all sorts of stories about this um, well you heard a story about what uh, oh, <laughs> about yeah. your appearance um, in um, class um, um, <laughs> um, um, yes well well the uh, indeed no um, um, many years later when I took my own first book uh, to an editor actually uh, an editor at Faber's they'd published a book of my mother's before that this editor said you you know we, we've met before and I said I, I'm don't remember it. I'm not very good at faces. And she said, no, she said, you wouldn't. She said, it was like this. She said, I was uh, one of your mother's students, and your mother was lecturing us on breastfeeding. And uh, after a while, she said, there's nothing difficult or embarrassing about it. And she bent down and pulled out a little baby, which had been concealed at the foot of her desk, and breastfed it in front of the class. And she said this was in September 1933, and you were the infant. <laughs> so, as you say, um, so at two months I, I was introduced <laughs> in this way. Um, and I, I think this, this was typical of my mother, in a way, who was so uh, sort of shy, you know, um, almost to muteness in some situations, but, but perfectly capable of, of breastfeeding a baby in front of 50 people. <laughs> On the other hand, and I think I'm probably rather rather similar. I can be absolutely mute sometimes in, in parties, and on the other hand, sort of be quite outrageous in front of a thousand people. You can see why I love him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and I know you've come up against um, some writers who have quite strict rules. Well, there was one we were asking earlier about J.M. Coetzee and how we got some of these writers on the show. The first time I interviewed J.M. Coetzee, he uh, came to Toronto to be at the Authors Festival and he had a, a wonderful book called Age of Iron, mm -hmm. which I thought was terrific. And um, he agreed to do two interviews, one for radio and uh, one for the Globe and Mail. And I was the radio. And so he, he came in, I, 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 he wasn't that he knew me or anything, it was just that was, he, I think, public radio. So he came into the studio and just before we're ready to start, he pulled out a little notebook that looked like a like one of those um, day timers with a pencil in the spine and the, the very, sort of very thin paper, and he started wrestling it open. And I thought he's looking to see my name, like his my his appointment book, to see who he's talking to. And he said, uh, "Do you mind if I write down the questions?" So I said no, and uh, luckily it wasn't live radio, and so I'd ask a question, and he would write down the question. So there'd be long silence, and then he would not make eye contact, and then he would answer the question. He would take apart a little bit about the question, but then he, would, he definitely would address this. And this went on, with back and forth, silence, answer, question, silence, answer. And then after about uh, 20 minutes, he said, I've lost my voice. But he said it just like I did, just now. <laughs> 